Just let me know. Right about here, in Dallas, Texas, American President John F. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963. The accused assassin was a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. After being held in custody for less than two days, Oswald himself would meet a violent end. According to a subsequent investigation, Oswald had fired three rounds from the Texas School Book Depository. Police recovered three shell casings and a bolt-action rifle from the sixth floor of the building. But the shooting of Oswald sparked immediate suspicions of conspiracy. Suspicions that persist to this day and have driven most Americans to reject the government's conclusion that Oswald acted alone. The arguments for and against conspiracy take many shapes and forms. Far too many in fact to do them all justice in a single video. Instead, in this video, I want to zoom in and focus on a very narrow slice of this case. Specifically, the events surrounding the Texas School Book DePaul story. What exactly happened inside this building from where the shots that killed the president are believed to have been fired? In September of 1963, a young man named Wesley Frazier received a call from an employment agency. There was a potential job opening at the Texas School Book DePaul story. On September the 13th, Frazier made his way from Irving, Texas, down to central Dallas. He met with Roy Truly, the superintendent of the building, and was hired on the spot. Back in Irving, Fraser lived with his older sister, Lini Randall. A few houses down the street lived a woman named Ruth Payne. On October the 14th, both Randall and Payne had a cup of coffee at the house of a neighbor. Payne brought along a friend and Russian immigrant named Marina Oswald, the wife of Lee Oswald. Marina could barely speak any English and had been staying with Payne for a few weeks partly due to her husband's unemployment. The subject of Lee looking for work and that he hadn't found work for a week came up while we were having coffee. And Mrs. Randall mentioned that her younger brother, Wesley Frazier, thought they needed another person at the Texas School Book Depository where Wesley worked. Payne and Marina returned home, spoke with Roy Truly over the phone, and secured a job interview on behalf of Lee Oswald. The following morning, he went down to the Book Depot story and began his first day of work on October the 16th. So, an acquaintance with whom Oswald's wife was currently staying had a casual conversation with a neighbor. That neighbor happened to have a brother who recently got employed at the Book DePaul story. This prompted his wife to ask the acquaintance to call the superintendent of the building to inquire about any vacancies. I told Mrs. Payne that to send Oswald down and I would talk to him, that I didn't have anything in mind for him of a permanent nature, but if he was suited, we could possibly use him for a brief time. The position was not only temporary, but only existed due to a temporary shortage of staff. It was the end of our fall rush. If it hadn't existed a week or two weeks longer, or if we had not been using some of our regular boys putting down this plywood floor, we would not have had any need for Lee Oswald at that time, which is a tragic thing for me to think about. But it gets even more tragic because Oswald was not the only one to apply for a job. I might have sent Oswald to work in a warehouse two blocks away. Oswald and another fellow reported for work on the same day, and I needed one of them for the depository building. I picked Oswald. If Oswald was somehow entangled in a conspiracy, and the aim of that conspiracy was for him to become employed at the Book DePaul story, this roundabout sequence of events is a very strange way to go about it. As the name implies, the Texas School Book DePaul story was in the business of selling books. 
For a buck twenty-five an hour, Oswald's job was to prepare the books for shipping. He did so by filling out forms and transporting cartons of books between the upper floors and the first. The building had three elevators, two staircases, and was seven stories tall. In the northwest corner, one stairway and two freight elevators provided access to all seven floors. A small passenger elevator near the front entrance stopped at level four, while stories one and two were connected by a second flight of stairs. Lacking a driver's license, Oswald relied on Wesley Fraser to carpool between Irving and Dallas every Friday evening and Monday morning. He spent workdays at a rooming house in Dallas while spending the weekends with his wife and daughters in Irving. But on Thursday morning, November the 21st, the day before the assassination, Oswald decided to deviate from this routine. I was standing there on the first floor getting the orders in and Lee said, could I ride home with you this afternoon? And I said, sure, you know, like I told you, you can go home with me anytime you want to. Like I say, anytime you want to go see your wife, that is all right with me. Lee had never gone home in the middle of the week before. So I asked him why and he stated that he was going home to get some curtain rods for his apartment. I asked if he was going home on Friday as well and he said no. Frazier drove Oswald back to Irving where he arrived unannounced at the household of Ruth Payne. Both Payne and Marina were surprised to see Oswald on a Thursday. They assumed he'd come to make amends with Marina due to an argument they had had a few days before. Did your husband give any reason for coming home on Thursday? He said that he was lonely because he hadn't come the preceding weekend and he wanted to make his peace with me. Was anything said about curtain rods or his taking curtain rods to town the following day? No, I didn't have any. He didn't say anything like that. No. The next day, Oswald said goodbye to his wife and left the Payne residence about a quarter past seven. Atop a dresser in the bedroom, he left behind his wedding ring. Oswald was next seen walking down the street by Lini Randall, carrying a package. He was soon joined by Fraser, and the two of them took a seat in his car to begin their commute. When you got in the car, did you say anything to Oswald or did he say anything to you? I noticed there was a package lying on the back seat. I didn't pay too much attention and I said, what's the package, Lee? And he said, curtain rods. And I said, oh yes, you told me you were gonna bring some today. Not only was Oswald carrying a large package, but he'd forgotten to bring a lunch bag. When he rode with me, I say he always brought lunch, except that one day on November 22nd. He didn't bring his lunch that day. Right when I got in the car, I asked him where was his lunch? And he said he was gonna buy his lunch that day. They arrived in Dallas a few minutes before 8 o'clock. Typically, they would walk together from the parking lot to the book the Paul story. But on this particular Friday, Oswald grabbed his curtain rods and rushed ahead into the building. Working on the ground floor in view of the rear entrance was their colleague, Jack Doherty. Did you see Oswald come to work that morning? Yes, when he first came into the door. Did he have anything in his hands or arms? Well, not that I could see of. Frazier and Doherty are the only two people known to have seen Oswald entering the building. Frazier says he was carrying a package. Doherty says he was not. Contradictions like this one will become a recurring theme throughout the rest of this video. We'll take a closer look at the missing curtain rods in a later chapter, but for now, let's stay with Oswald. As the morning progressed, Oswald was seen working as normal. Roy Truly described him as an above-average worker who mostly kept himself. In fact, he was a bit of a mystery to his colleagues. On the way back and forth between Irving and Dallas, did you talk very much to each other? No, sir, not very much. He was one of these types that just didn't talk. I was acquainted with Lee Oswald during the time he was employed at the book depository, but I never did get to know him well. He did not mix with the other employees and did not appear to want to make friends with me or any of the others. Did you ever speak to Oswald? Yes, sir. Did he ever speak to you? No, sir. He never replied to you? No, sir. Would you say he was unfriendly? Yes, sir, I would. But there were exceptions to his reticence and one of them occurred on this Friday morning. James Jarman was working on the ground floor when he observed Oswald staring at the window facing Elm Street. 
Oswald was standing up in the window, and I went to the window also. And he asked me, what were people gathering around the corner for? And I told him that the president was supposed to pass in the morning, and he asked me, did I know which way he was coming? And I told him, yes, he'll probably come down Maine and turn on Houston and then back again on Elm. Then he said, oh, I see. And that was all. It's a brief yet fascinating moment. It almost seems as though Oswald had no idea that Kennedy would pass by the book de Paul story. This was indeed the case for some of his colleagues. Jarman himself had only been made aware of the fact shortly before he spoke with Oswald. There's no doubt that Oswald knew the president was coming to Dallas, but whether he knew the route of the motorcade is much more difficult to prove. The route of the motorcade had only been finalized a few days before the visit and hinged upon its destination. Kennedy was supposed to attend a banquet in Dallas, but no one could agree on a venue. It came down to two options, the trademark northwest of downtown or the women's building to the east. One of the more vocal proponents of the trademark was Texas Governor John Connolly, and after much back and forth, he finally got his way on November the 14th. Had the women's building been selected, the motorcade would have sped through Dealey Plaza, east on Main Street, significantly further away and perpendicular to the Book de Paul story. Not to mention that First Lady Jacqueline would have been seated between the building and the president. The selection of the trademark meant that the motorcade would now head west on Main Street and make these turns through Dealey Plaza to reach the northbound lanes on the freeway. Now, these turns could still have been avoided had the motorcade continued like so and not taken the freeway. But since the freeway was the more scenic and expedient route, it was the more attractive choice. All of that is to say, the success of the assassination was largely dependent upon the selection of the trademark. It might therefore be tempting to cast suspicion upon Governor Connolly, but it should be noted that he rode in the presidential limousine along with the Kennedys and suffered grave injuries during the shooting. Not only that, but Connolly was actually opposed to a motorcade and favored a more direct route from the airport to the trademark, a brief trip that would have bypassed Dealey Plaza altogether. He was unfortunately overruled by Kennedy himself, who wanted to see and be seen by the people of Dallas. Okay, so all that was happening behind the scenes, but as far as the public was aware, there wasn't even going to be a motorcade. As late as November the 15th, the Dallas Morning News reported that the motorcade seemed unlikely. But the very next day, the parade was finally confirmed. While the precise route followed by maps and detailed descriptions was not officially disclosed until November the 19th, someone familiar with Dallas could have approximated the route a few days in advance. That is to say, the earliest point a member of the public could have deduced that Kennedy would be driven past the Book de Paul story was November the 16th, less than a week before the visit. There's a good chance that Oswald saw these articles because he'd been observed reading political columns in the very same newspapers. Furthermore, we know from other aspects of Oswald's life that he was politically inclined. Well, I have uh, studied Marxist philosophy, yes sir, and also other philosophers. But are you a Marxist? I think you did admit on an earlier radio interview that you, uh, that you consider yourself a Marxist. Well, I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But that, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. What is the difference between the two? Well, there's a great deal of difference. Several uh, American parties in several countries are based on Marxism, such as Ghana. Uh, Ghana. Uh, certain countries have uh, characteristics uh, of a socialist system, such as Great Britain with its uh, socialized medicine. Uh, these, then, are the differences between an outright communist country and countries which adhere to leftist or Marxist uh, uh, principles. Conversely, a lack of interest in politics is precisely why at least one of Oswald's colleagues remained oblivious to the motorcade. So while it's understandable for someone apolitical to be taken off guard by a presidential visit, it makes far less sense for someone like Oswald. On November 21st, the day before the assassination that you were describing, was there any discussion between you and your husband about President Kennedy's trip or proposed trip to Texas, Dallas and the Fort Worth area? I asked Lee whether he knew where the president would speak and told him that I would very much like to hear him and to see him. I asked him how this could be done, but he said he didn't know how to do that and didn't enlarge any further on the subject. Had there ever this been... was also somewhat unusual, his lack of desire to talk about that subject any further. How did you think it was unusual? Could you explain that? The fact that he didn't talk a lot about it. He merely gave me 
said something as an answer and did not have any further comments. Do you mean by that, usually he would discuss a matter of that kind and show considerable interest? Yes, of course. He would have told me who would be there and where this would take place. We'll never know what Oswald was thinking when he spoke with James Jarman shortly before the assassination. But it is worth repeating, though, that Oswald was hired on October the 15th. That's a full month before the Motgate route had been decided, let alone announced to the public. On the morning of November 22nd, a handful of employees had been assigned to install a new plywood floor on the sixth floor of the book depository. Every once in a while, they would catch a glimpse of Oswald. I saw Lee Oswald shortly before lunchtime. He was by himself with a piece of paper in his hand. I had nothing to say to him, but some of the other male employees teased him and told him he ought to go get a haircut. Lee Oswald just laughed at this remark. Shortly before noon, it was time for lunch. For a bit of fun, they decided to race the two elevators down to ground level. As they began descending, they observed Oswald now standing on the fifth floor. He shouted for them to stop or to close the gate to the elevator upon reaching the first floor. Charles Givens then realized he'd forgotten his jacket and cigarettes up on the sixth floor. About to return to ground level, Givens spotted Oswald approaching. Lee was coming from the window up front where the shots were fired from. Did you watch where he walked to? Well, no, sir. I didn't pay much attention. I was getting ready to get on the elevator, and I say, Boy, are you going downstairs? What did he say to you? I say, It's near lunchtime. And he said, No, sir. When you get downstairs, close the gate to the elevator. That meant the elevator on the west side. You can pull both gates down, and it'll come up by itself. What else did he say? That is all. I said, Okay and got on the elevator. And with that, Givens became the last person inside the Book de Paul story known to have seen Oswald before the assassination. At least, that's the official story. The encounter was fixed at 11.55, more than half an hour before the shooting. But other employees claimed to have seen Oswald in other parts of the building around the same time or even later than Givens. Givens himself provided conflicting accounts. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This encounter notwithstanding, Givens was not the last person to visit the sixth floor. Shortly after Givens had left, Bonnie Williams grabbed his lunch and went upstairs. He sat down right about here to await the president's arrival. Now, when you were sitting by the window, could you see down towards the southeast corner? No, sir. I couldn't see anything as I remember there. About the only thing that I could see from there would be the top edge of the window because the boxes were stacked up. Did you see anyone else up there that day? No, I did not. The southeast corner is the location from where the shots that kill the president are believed to have been fired, the so-called sniper's nest. William says he was alone, but admits his view was obstructed by tall stacks of boxes. Meanwhile, down by the main entrance, someone was attempting to gain access to the building. I met an elderly white man at the entrance of the building who asked me to direct him to a restroom. The man was very old and feeble and could hardly make it up the steps. About five minutes later, I saw this man leave the building and enter an old Buick automobile with three elderly white women. Uh, the Buick then drove away. Did you see him talk to anyone in the building? No, he went straight out. This individual was never identified and is the only unknown person known to have entered the book depository before the shooting. After finishing his lunch up on the sixth floor, Bonnie Williams heard the voices of James Jarman and Harold Norman emanating from the floor below. Feeling a bit lonely, Williams went down to the fifth floor and joined his two colleagues. The exact time of Williams' departure is unclear, but it was likely no more than 10 or even five minutes before the shooting. On the grounds below, a sea of spectators lined the streets of Elm in Houston. Every once in a while, one of them would glance up at the book to Paul story. Indeed, Jarman, Williams, and Norman were spotted on multiple occasions, leaning out the far east windows on the fifth floor. But movement could also be seen on the floor above them, a floor that, by all accounts, was now supposed to be empty. A 
Awaiting the motorcade by the east curb of Houston was a young, newlywed couple named Arnold and Barbara Rowland. Some 15 minutes before the shooting, Arnold spotted a white man in the westernmost window on the sixth floor of the book depository. The man was holding a rifle, his gaze locked at Houston. Despite standing a few meters away from an officer, Arnold chose not to report the gunman. Did it ever enter your mind that you should go and tell the policeman of this sight or this vision that you had seen? Really, it didn't. It never entered your mind? I never dreamed of anything such as that. I mean, I must honestly say, my opinion was based on movies I have seen, on the attempted assassination of Theodore Roosevelt and the other one, Franklin Roosevelt. And both of these had secret service men up in windows or on top of the buildings with rifles. And this is how my opinion was based and why it didn't alarm me. Perhaps if I had been older and, and had more experience in life, it might have made a difference. It very well could have. Do you ever have reoccurring dreams, sir? What? Do you ever have reoccurring dreams? Uh, yes. This is a reoccurring dream of mine, sir. All the time. What if I had told someone about it? I knew about it enough in advance, and perhaps it could have been prevented. I mean, this is something which shakes me up at times. If Roland's recollection is accurate, it stands in direct conflict with that of Bonnie Williams, who claimed to have eaten lunch on the same floor at the same time. Williams neither saw nor heard anyone, despite having an unobstructed view down to the southwest corner of the building where Roland claimed to have seen the gunman. A few minutes later, a different spectator named Howard Brennan spotted a white man pacing to and fro the easternmost window on the sixth floor. At half past 12, the presidential limousine emerged from behind the building and began driving north on Houston. As the car made a sharp left turn at Elm, a high school student named Amos Ewens glanced up at the book The Paul Story and caught sight of a protruding metal rod. Few realized what had happened. Was it a firecracker, backfiring motorcycle, or presidential salute? People near the Rollins even started laughing, perhaps feeling a bit foolish for being frightened by the ostensibly harmless explosion. Standing by the northwest corner of Elm in Houston was James Worrell. He thought the explosion had come from directly overhead. Sure enough, on one of the upper floors, Worrell could see the barrel of a gun. At that moment, a second explosion echoed through Dealey Plaza. Worrell and Ewens witnessed the recoil and muscle flash of the rifle in concurrence with the sound. Brennan had yet to realize what was happening. He thought a firecracker had been thrown from the book The Paul Story. He looked up and the man he'd seen pacing only minutes before was now aiming down the sights of a rifle. President Kennedy in Texas Governor John Connolly shot by an assassin today in Dallas, Texas. Brennan could only recall hearing two shots, but his testimony implies he might have heard three. He confusingly said he saw the gunman fire the last shot, yet denied seeing the discharge of the rifle. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, the rifle was seen by a handful of witnesses as the gunman cautiously withdrew from the window. The rifle, or what looked like a rifle, was drawn fairly slowly back into the building, and I saw no one in the window with it. I didn't even see a form in the window. I could see his hand, you know, the rifle laying across his hand, and I could see his hand sticking out on the trigger part. After he got through, he just pulled it back in the window. He drew the gun back from the window, as though he was drawing it back to his side, and maybe paused for another second as though to assure himself that he hit his mark, and then he disappeared. Neither Ewens nor Worrell saw the face of the gunman and could thus offer little to no information regarding his appearance. Arnold was quite some distance away, yet furnished a basic description of the man he'd seen about a quarter of an hour before the shooting, a description that was quite similar to the one provided by Brennan, who got the best look at the gunman. Taken together, these accounts paint a picture of an assassin on the sixth floor of the Book de Paul story, taking aim with a rifle and firing at the president from the sniper's nest. But other accounts leave room for a bit of doubt.
As previously mentioned, Arnold Rowland spotted a white man with a rifle in the westernmost window on the sixth floor about a quarter past twelve. But as late as five minutes before the shooting, Arnold observed an elderly black man leaning out the easternmost window on the same floor. He might have confused the sixth floor with the fifth, where James Jarman, Bonnie Williams, and Harold Norman did indeed lean out the windows. In fact, they were the only black employees known to have watched the motorcade from a floor above the first. Except they could hardly be described as elderly. But then, take a listen to this. Will you describe with as much particularity as you can what that man looked like? It seemed to me an elderly black man. That is about all. I didn't pay very much attention to him. This question was then repeated to Arnold a few minutes later, at which point his answer had dramatically changed. He was very thin, um, an elderly gentleman, bald or practically bald, very thin hair if he wasn't bald, had on a plaid shirt, I think it was red and green, very bright color, that is why I remember it. Can you give us an estimate as to age? 50, possibly 55 or 60. Can you give us an estimate as to height? 5'8", five, 5'10", five, in that neighborhood. He was very slender, very thin. Can you give us a more definite description as to complexion? Very dark or fairly dark. Not real dark compared to some black men, but fairly dark. Seemed like his face was either, I can't recall detail, but it was either very wrinkled or marked in some way. So, in the span of a few minutes, Arnold went from I didn't pay very much attention to describing the man's complexion, hair, clothing, age, height, build, and even the blemishes on his face. Sometimes some people are prone to exaggerate more than others, and without in any way meaning to take away from the testimony of your husband as to what he saw in the building at the time, just from your general experience, do you feel you can rely on everything that your husband says? I don't feel that I can rely on everything anybody says. Well, this is really an unfair question for me to ask any wife about her husband, and I am not asking it very correctly, at but- At times, my husband is prone to exaggerate. Does that answer it? I think it does. Is there anything else you want to add to that or not? Usually, his exaggerations are not concerned with anything other than himself. They're usually to boost his ego. They usually say that he is really smarter than he is, or he's a better salesman than he is. Something like that. As leading as that line of questioning was, Barbara was not alone in doubting her husband's credibility. Officials at two separate high schools attended by Arnold explicitly warned authorities not to trust everything he says. He was characterized as someone who would not hesitate to fabricate a story and not tell the truth regarding any matter. Indeed, Roland lied or exaggerated on multiple occasions when he testified. Another witness who claimed to have seen a gunman in the Book de Pont story was Carolyn Walter. Shortly before the arrival of the motorcade, Walter had seen a man with blonde or light brown hair in one of these windows on the fourth or fifth floor. She explicitly ruled out the sixth. It should be noted, however, that during the shooting, this window was closed with the blinds down, while this one, as you already know, was occupied by Bonnie Williams and Harold Norman. In any case, the light-haired man seen by Walter was holding a machine gun, and standing beside him was another man wearing a brown suit. Much like Arnold Rowland, Walter assumed the gunman was a presidential guard and refrained from telling the police. In fact, there's no evidence she told anyone of what she'd seen, not even the colleague with whom she watched the motorcade. In Walter's defense, two other witnesses recalled seeing a man with light or light brown hair on the fifth or sixth floor. Except they never saw a weapon, nor an accomplice. Disagreements regarding the floors were at least in part due to the ground floor lacking visible windows. How do you know it was the sixth floor, sixth floor rather than the fifth floor? I went with the FBI and I showed him the window, and I didn't count the bottom floor. You mean, the first time you gave a statement, you didn't count the bottom floor? That's right. Another source of confusion was the distinct visual difference between the seventh floor and the ones below. When you first glance at the building, you're thrown off a little as to the floors because there's a ridge. It almost looks like a structure added onto the top of the building, about one story above. So you have to recount. Not only that, but multiple witnesses described the sixth floor as the second floor from the top. But in the chaos that ensued, it seems the tail end of that sentence was not always recorded. Amos Ewens is another curious witness because even though he never saw the gunman's face, he did see the top of his head. Somehow. 
What did you see in the building? I saw a bald spot on this man's head. Trying to look out the window, he had a bald spot on his head. I was looking at the bald spot. Oswald did not have a bald spot. He was thinning a bit in the front, but otherwise had a full head of hair. But the strength of Ewan's account is somewhat diminished by his inability to recall much of anything else. Could you tell whether he was a black gentleman or a white man? No, sir. Couldn't even tell that, but you have described that he had a bald spot in his head. Yes, sir. I could see the bald spot in his head. Now, could you tell what color hair he had? No, sir. Could you tell whether his hair was dark or light? No, sir. Long after the assassination, 15 years to be precise, a journalist working for the Dallas Morning News tracked on a man named Johnny Powell. Powell had supposedly seen two men fiddling with a scope and a rifle in the sniper's nest. He described their complexion as darker than white, but uh, that was about it. Once again, one has to wonder if he confused the gunmen with Jarman, Williams and Norman on the floor below. I mean, after 15 years of silence, there's no telling how Powell's memory could have been distorted. A good example of such distortion is Richard Carr. A few minutes before the shooting, Carr had been standing roughly here when he spotted a man on the seventh floor of the book depository, all the way over here. The man was white and wore a hat, glasses and sport coat. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Carr returned to ground level and caught sight of what he believed to be the same man now trotting south on Houston. He made a left turn right about here before being picked up by a station wagon. By 1969, however, Carr's story had notably changed. The man with a sport coat had now been standing on the fifth floor, not the seventh. After the shooting, Mr. Sport Coat had emerged from behind the book depot story, accompanied by two other men. They too had been picked up by a separate station wagon before speeding away. It's unclear how Carr is supposed to have seen all of this, considering what he told the FBI back in 64. Carr advised that from his location on the steel structure of the new courthouse building, it would have been impossible for him to observe the lower floors and entrance of the book depository, and that from his position he could only see the top floor and the roof. In Carr's defense, James Worrell had seen a man emerge from the rear entrance of the book depository about three minutes after the shooting. This man also wore a sport coat and headed south on Houston. Except the man seen by Carr was kind of stocky and wore a hat, while the man seen by Worrell had a slender build and was hatless. Besides, anyone connected with the shooting, leaving via the rear entrance, would surely have headed north, not towards the scene of the crime. As if that was not enough, two other witnesses, James Romack and George Rackley, stood roughly here for several minutes after the shooting. Both of them paid special attention to the rear entrance of the building. Mr. Romack stated that from the time he heard the shots, he had looked toward the book depository and had, under his immediate observation, the loading dock and the back door. He stated he is positive that no one came out of this door or out of the loading dock doors. Could you see the back door of the Texas School Book Depository? Yes. Were you looking towards that direction? Yes, sir. About how long did you keep your eyes fixed over there? Oh, I would say five minutes anyhow, probably 10. I was looking up that way at all times. Did you see any people leave the Texas School Book Depository by way of the rear exit? No, sir. Did you see any people running north on Houston Street? N no, sir. Unfortunately, conflicting accounts were not limited to the Book de Paul story. Among the hundreds of witnesses in the vicinity of Dealey Plaza, nothing was as disputed as the number and origin of the gunshots. And Governor Connolly was holding his stomach. And the shots were almost simultaneously, weren't they? Yes, sir. They were probably 10 seconds apart. Do you know apart. who fired the third shot? I didn't hear a third. I, I don't recall a third shot. There may have been. I, at, we hit, my family hit the ground, and I don't recall a third shot. Uh, I just couldn't. I'm not certain of that. I do know I heard two shots. Yeah, I heard three. I know you there heard were three. three. Well, yeah, I said to Jerry after the second shot, I said, my God, those are gunshots. No one knows exactly how many spectators were in or near Dili Plaza at the time of the assassination. Well over 200 were at some point questioned by a combination of authorities, journalists and others. Attempts have been made to consolidate the various accounts, and it's clear from all such attempts that the majority of witnesses heard three shots. What's a bit less clear is the source of the explosions. 
The gunman was either placed in the vicinity of the Book Depot story, marked here in red, or an area west of the building, marked in green, known as the Grassy Knoll. But as you can see from these pie charts, the assessment of ear witness testimony is highly susceptible to bias. It's a surprisingly subjective exercise that can lead to widely different results. Nevertheless, there were a substantial number of witnesses who pointed to the grassy knoll, located roughly here, and many of them were scattered throughout the plaza. To give you some examples, August Campbell was standing near the front entrance of the book depository, yet believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. Meanwhile, Marilyn Sitzman was standing on the grassy knoll, yet believed the shots had come from the book depository. Standing beside Campbell was a woman named Geraldine Reed, who believed the shots had come from the book depository. Standing by the curb in front of Sitzman was William Newman, who believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. One might therefore conclude that there must have been two assassins, one in the book depository and one on the grassy knoll. Indeed, countless authors and even a congressional investigation have done precisely that. Now, the scope of this video is not nearly exhaustive enough for me to attempt any conclusions regarding a second gunman, but I do want to leave you with this. You might have seen these unlabeled blue slices before. Well, that's how many witnesses heard gunshots coming from multiple directions. That is to say, next to no one did. All the shots came either from the east or west, not both. Mr. Campbell believed the noise came from away from the book depository. This illusion, he explained, may have been due to the sound bouncing off the building and other objects in the vicinity. Marcus Campbell was far from alone in being deceived by the pronounced echoes of the gunshots. Where did the noises or shots sound to you like they came from? It was hard to tell because they had an echo, you know. There was actually two explosions with each one. There was the shot and then the echo from it, so it was hard to tell. There was too much reverberation. There was an echo which gave me a sound all over. In other words, that square is kind of, it had a sound all over. The sounds came either from up against the school depository building or near the mouth of the triple underpass. I had worked in this watchtower for some 10 or 12 years and was there during the time they were renovating the school depository building and had noticed at that time the similarity of sounds occurring in either of those two locations. There is a reverberation which takes place from either location. This auditory illusion was not a fluke. Not only did the building surrounding Dili Plaza act as an echo chamber, but even experienced hunters can struggle to pinpoint the number and origin of gunshots by sound alone. Here's a quote from a book on that very topic, published a few years before the assassination. Little credence should be put in what anyone says about a shot or even the number of shots. These things coming upon a person suddenly are generally extremely inaccurately recorded in their memory. One of the authors asked one deer hunter last fall how many shots another hunter less than 100 yards away had fired. The answer was five. Actually, only two shots were fired. Employees in the book Depot story were no less confused about the gunshots than the spectators outside. To give you some examples, on the first floor, Eddie Piper heard three shots that appeared to come from inside the building. On the third floor, Edna Case and Sandra Ellison heard nothing. Meanwhile, Stephen Wilson, on the same floor, heard three shots, came from the west. On the fourth floor, Elsie Dorman, multiple shots, came from this building across the street. Victoria Adams, three shots, from the west. Mary Hollis, three shots, inside the building. But some employees not only heard the shots, but could literally feel the explosions shake the building. Could you tell where the shots were coming from? Yes, sir. They came from inside the building. How do you know that? Because the building vibrated from the result of the explosion coming in. Did you know they were shots at the time? Yes, sir. They sounded almost like cannon shots. They were so terrific. Much like Geneva Hine on the second floor, Bonnie Williams could feel the explosions up on the fifth. It sounded to Williams as though the shots had been fired from the floor above. His colleague, James Jarman, initially thought the shots had come from somewhere below, but then changed his mind and agreed with Williams. Harold Norman, meanwhile, heard far more than gunshots. Just after the president passed by, I heard a shot. And several seconds later, I heard two more shots. I knew that the shots had come from directly above me, and I could hear the expended cartridges fall to the floor. I could also hear the bolt action of the rifle. 
The explosions shook the building, and a piece of loose plaster or dirt was dislodged from the ledge above and struck Williams in the head. Meanwhile, spectators on the streets below could see them leaning out the windows, looking up at the sixth floor. I just looked straight up ahead of me, which would have been looking at the school book depository, and I noticed two black men in a window, straining to see directly above them, and my eyes followed right up to the window above them, and I saw the rifle, or what looked like a rifle. Frightened and somewhat entranced by the pandemonium outside, the three men remained on the fifth floor for several minutes. Meanwhile, the apparent assassin upstairs was now in a race against time. Did you hear anything upstairs at all? No, sir. I didn't hear anything. Any footsteps? No, sir. Probably. The reason we didn't hear anything is because, you know, after the shots, we were running too. And that was making a louder noise. Why didn't you go up to the sixth floor? I really don't know. We just never did think about it. Maybe it's because we were frightened. When the shooting began, motorcycle policeman Marion Baker had just made a right turn from Main Street to Houston. Baker recognized the explosions as gunfire and could see a flock of pigeons fluttering above two buildings further up ahead. Baker made a split-second decision and headed for the book depository. Once inside, he was greeted by Roy Truly. Truly directed Baker to the elevators, but neither was available. He pressed the button while shouting up the elevator shaft for someone upstairs to close the gate. No response. Instead, they began running up the stairs. As I came out to the second floor there, Mr. Truly was ahead of me, and as I come out, I was kind of scanning, you know, the, the rooms, and I caught a glimpse of this man walking away from this. I happened to see him through this window in this door. I don't know how come I saw him, but I had a glimpse of him coming down there. Where was he coming from, do you know? No, sir. All I seen of him was a glimpse of him go away from me. What did you do? I hollered at him at that time and said, come here. He turned and walked right straight back to me. What did you say to him? I didn't get anything out of him. Mr. Truly had come up to my side here, and I turned to Mr. Truly and I says, Do you know this man? Does he work here? And he said, Yes. And I turned immediately and went on out up the stairs. The man whom Baker and Truly encountered in the second floor lunchroom was none other than Lee Harvey Oswald. The encounter was brief, lasting no more than 30 seconds. Oswald appeared calm and failed to evoke suspicion, so Truly and Baker left them in the lunchroom and proceeded up the stairs. They spent some time searching the roof, but there was no assassin to be found. Down by the main entrance, Geraldine Reed was still trying to process what had just occurred. She decided to return to her office on the second floor of the building. Here, about two minutes after the shooting, Reed became the last known person to have seen Oswald inside the book depository. I kept walking and I looked up and Oswald was coming in the back door of the office. I met him by the time I passed my desk by several feet and I told him, I said, oh, the president has been shot, but maybe they didn't hit him. He mumbled something to me. I kept walking. He did too. I didn't pay any attention to what he said because I had no thoughts of him having any connection with the shooting at all because he was very calm. Oswald is then presumed to have taken the front stairs and, on his way out the main entrance, encountered someone looking for a phone. There are at least two candidates for who this person might have been, but Oswald seems to have pointed out the phone inside the building before blending into the chaos outside. He was next observed boarding a bus a few blocks east of Helm. Nearly four months after the assassination, Truly and Baker participated in a crude reconstruction of the shooting to time their movements. The experiment was repeated twice. On the first attempt, it took them one minute and 30 seconds to reach the second floor lunchroom. Then, one minute and 15 seconds. These time trials were primarily conducted to determine whether Oswald could have fired the shots from the sixth floor and still made it down to the second in time for his encounter with Truly and Baker. 
After all, if there wasn't enough time, Oswald could not have been the assassin. A bunch of different routes were tested, and while Oswald could theoretically have taken one of the elevators or even the fire escape, in practice, there wasn't enough time. You do not think the assassin used any of the elevators at any time to get from the sixth to the second floor? You mean after the shooting? No, sir. He just could not, because those elevators, I saw myself, were both on the fifth floor. They were both even. The only other means of descent was the stairway. A stand-in for the gunman trotted down from the sixth floor to the second in one minute and 18 seconds. Then, at a slightly faster pace, in one minute and 14 seconds. There was just enough time. It's therefore possible that Oswald stopped on the second floor, perhaps upon hearing Truly shouting up the elevator shaft, and attempted to hide in the lunchroom mere seconds ahead of Truly and Baker's arrival. But it's not quite that simple, because Oswald was not the only person using the stairway to escape the building. As previously mentioned, Victoria Adams watched the motorcade from an office on the fourth floor of the Book Depaul story. Within 30 seconds of the shooting, Adams ran down the stairs to the first floor along with her colleague, Sandra Stiles. When you got to the bottom of the first floor, did you see anyone there as you entered the first floor from the stairway? Yes, sir. Who did you see? Mr. William Shelley and Billy Lovelady. Now, what did you do after you encountered Mr. Shelley and Mr. Lovelady? I said I believed the president was shot. Do you remember what they said? Nothing. Then what did you do? I proceeded out to the Houston Street Dock. There are two significant problems with Adam's account. The first being that she and Stiles supposedly left the fourth floor within 30 seconds of the shooting and then ran down the stairs to the first. This would place them in approximate sync with Oswald, descending from the sixth floor to the second. Now, as you were running down the stairs, did you encounter anyone? Not during the actual running down the stairs, no sir. Did you hear anyone using the stairs? No sir. But okay, perhaps Oswald was a few flights above and his footsteps were drowned out by their own. This would mean that Stiles and Adams left the fourth floor mere seconds ahead of Oswald's arrival, reached the ground floor mere seconds ahead of Roy Truly and Marion Baker's ascent, before encountering William Shelley and Billy Lovelady right about here. But this is when problem number two makes an entrance. When the president was shot, Shelley and Lovelady stood on the front steps of the Book Depository. They spent several minutes roaming about outside before returning to the building. And that's the problem. How did Stiles and Adams encounter Shelley and Lovelady within seconds of the shooting if it took them several minutes to return to the building? Who did you see on the first floor after returning to the Book Depository? I saw a girl, but I wouldn't swear to it. It's Vicky. What is her full name? I wouldn't know. Vicky Adams? I believe so. Would you say it was Vicky you saw? I couldn't swear. Where was the girl? I don't remember what place she was, but I remember seeing a girl and she was talking to Shelley or saw Shelley or something. Shelley could recall no such incident. Presuming that Lovelady was correct and Shelley had a lapse of memory, it's possible their encounter with Stiles and Adams occurred minutes rather than seconds after the shooting. After all, Adams could have been mistaken. This scenario implies that Oswald made his escape, Truly and Baker went upstairs, and then several minutes later, Stiles and Adams left the building. But it's not quite that simple. Watching the motorcade alongside Stiles and Adams was their supervisor, Dorothy Garner. Miss Garner stated this morning that after Miss Adams went downstairs, she, Miss Garner, saw Mr. Truly and the policeman come up. Not only does this account corroborate that of Adams, meaning they left within seconds, not minutes, but it implies that Garner was in a position to observe the stairway from somewhere on the fourth floor. In spite of this, Garner made no mention of seeing Oswald scampering down the stairs between Stiles and Adams' departure and Truly and Baker's arrival. What makes this conflict so difficult to resolve is that neither Stiles nor Garner were called to testify. We have but a few brief statements of what they witnessed. All we know about Sandra Stiles is that she went down the stairs with Adams. Did it happen within seconds of the shooting? We don't know. Did she see or hear anyone else while running down the stairs? We don't know. Did she encounter Shelley and Lovelady on the first floor? We don't know. 
Authorities appear to have presumed Adams unreliable and then ignored the witnesses who could have easily refuted or confirmed that presumption. A simple reenactment like the one granted Truly and Baker could have gone a long way to resolve this issue. But that never happened. Many decades after the assassination, author Barry Ernest was able to track down Sandra Stiles, Dorothy Garner, and Victoria Adams. Stiles confirmed that she and Adams left the window within seconds of the shooting, but she doesn't explicitly say they left the fourth floor within seconds. In any case, as they moved quickly down the stairs, she heard no footfall apart from their own. Garner confirmed she never witnessed the descent of Oswald, despite seeing Truly and Baker heading upstairs. Adams went a bit further and accused investigators of tampering with their testimony. I'm beginning to wonder if the Shelley and Lovelady encounter was inserted into my testimony later. I remember saying to a fairly big black man inside the building, right near the loading dock, right after I got down the stairs, that I thought the president may have been shot. Sandra Stiles apparently told Ernest something similar. A few people were milling around on the first floor. One was a black man. Shelley and Lovelady were definitely not on the first floor when we got there. The only black employees who could have possibly made it to the rear stairway in time were Carl Jones, Roy Lewis, Eddie Piper, and Troy West. What you see here are their approximate positions at the time of the shooting, but during the seconds and minutes that followed, only Piper is known to have paid any attention to the stairs in the back. As soon as the shooting began, Piper crossed the first floor to get a better view of a clock. He remained in roughly this location until he observed Truly and Baker running up the stairs. Had anybody come down the steps before Truly and Baker went up the steps? No, sir. Did Vicky Adams come down before Truly and Baker went up the steps? No, sir. No, sir. She didn't do it. Remember James Romack and George Rackley? I mean, I wouldn't blame you if you don't, there's like a hundred different names to keep track of, but they were the ones who failed to spot anyone leaving the book depository via the rear entrance for several minutes after the shooting. Well, the thing is, according to both Stiles and Adams, they left the book depository via the rear entrance upon reaching the first floor. So if Romack and Rackley are to be believed, then once again, the descent of Stiles and Adams must have taken place minutes rather than seconds after the shooting. Not only that, but when Sandra Stiles was contacted by another researcher, she apparently expressed great uncertainty regarding the stairwell descent and thought it might in fact have occurred a couple of minutes after the shooting. I don't know what to make of all this. The conspiracy crowd will, of course, amplify the more suspicious elements, while those who support the official narrative will focus on that which discredits Adams. But ultimately, we don't know the exact timeline of events. It's difficult enough to pin down the minute-by-minute -minute chronology. Once you get down to seconds, there's a lot of guesswork at play. The time trials by Truly and Baker gives us a rough estimate, but that's not cast in stone. They could have easily been a bit faster, a bit slower. So too could have Shelley, Lovelady, Garner, Stiles, Adams, and Oswald. Would you say that the reconstruction that we did on March the 20th was a minimum or a maximum time? Oh, I would say that would be the minimum time. We did everything that I did that day, and this would be the minimum time, because I'm sure that I, you know, it took me a little longer. I must also mention that we don't know much about the layout of the fourth floor beyond this crude schematic. If the other floors are any indication, much of this space was occupied by bookshelves and tall stacks of boxes. This is significant because Dorothy Garner never actually saw Stiles and Adams enter the stairway. She only heard footsteps of what she presumed to be them running down the stairs. Following a quick sweep of the roof, Roy Truly and Marion Baker returned to the ground floor of the book to Paul story. What did you do when you got back to the first floor, or what did you see? When I got back to the first floor, at first I didn't see anything except officers running around, reporters in the place. There was a regular madhouse. Had they sealed off the building yet, do you know? I am sure they had. Then what? Then, in a few minutes, it could have been moments or minutes at a time like that, I noticed some of my boys were over in the west corner of the shipping department, and there were several officers over there taking their names and addresses and so forth. 
I noticed that Lee Oswald was not among these boys. Oswald was not the only absentee, but he was the only one whom truly knew for a fact had left the building after the shooting. Meanwhile, on the sixth floor, a stack of boxes in the southeast corner attracted the attention of Deputy Luke Mooney. I went straight across to the southeast corner of the building and I saw all these high boxes. And the minute I squeezed between these two stacks of boxes, I had to turn myself sideways to get in there. That is when I saw the expended shells and the boxes that were stacked up looked to be a rest for the weapon. Two windows west of the sniper's nest, authorities found a bottle of Dr. Pepper and some chicken bones, leftovers from the lunch eaten by Bonnie Williams shortly before the assassination. But according to some officers, including Mooney, remains of a similar meal were also found in the sniper's nest. Does this photograph show any place where you saw the chicken bone? If I recall correctly, the chicken bone could have been laying on this box, or it might have been laying on this box right here. There was one of them partially eaten, and there was a little small paper poke. By poke, you mean a paper sack? Right. The assassin could just maybe take one step and lay it over there if he was the one that put it there. In spite of this, no such items were ever photographed. Apart from the sack of chicken bones found here, there are no records of leftovers being recovered from anywhere else near the sniper's nest. Now, did you see a chicken bone over near the boxes in the southeast corner? I don't believe there was one there. You didn't see any. One witness, a deputy sheriff named Luke Mooney, said he found a piece of chicken partly eaten on top of one of the boxes. Did you see anything like that? No. Was anything like that called to your attention? I can't recall anything like that. But it wasn't just the chicken bones. There were similar disagreements regarding the three cartridge cases. According to Mooney, Dallas Police Captain William Fritz tampered with the evidence. Are those the empty shells you found? Yes, sir. Now, will you take this marker and encircle the shells? All right. They were turned over to Captain Fritz? Yes, sir. He was the first officer that picked them up, as far as I know, because I stood there and watched him go over and pick them up and look at them. Is this the position of the cartridges, as shown in this photograph, as you saw them? Yes, sir. That is just about the way they were laying, to the best of my knowledge. I do know there was one further away, and these other two were relatively close to each other on this particular area. But these cartridges, this one and this one, looks like they are further apart than they actually was. Now, I didn't quite understand. Did you say that it was your memory that A and B were not that close together? Just from my memory, it seems that this cartridge ought to have been over this way a little further. You mean the B cartridge should be closer to the C? Closer to the C, yes, sir. Mooney did not explicitly state, but strongly implied that Captain Fritz moved at least one of the cartridge cases before they were photographed. According to Fritz, he did everything by the book. I told him not to move the cartridges, not to touch anything till we could get the crime lab to take pictures of them, just as they were lying there. And I left an officer assigned there to see that that was done. And the crime lab came almost immediately and took pictures and dusted the shells for prints. Amidst the swarm of officers canvassing the sixth floor was a lone journalist by the name of Thomas Ollier. Ollier was equipped with a camera and actually filmed much of the frantic search effort. About three decades later, Ollier made some rather startling claims that were largely consistent with, but also expanded upon those made by Mooney. After filming the casings, I asked Captain Fritz, who was standing at my side, if I could go behind the barricade and get a close-up shot of the casings. He told me that it would be better if I got my shots from outside the barricade. He then rounded the pile of boxes and entered the enclosure. This was the first time anybody walked between the barricade and the windows. Fritz then walked to the casings, picked them up, and held them in his hand over the top of the boxes for me to get a close-up shot of the evidence. I filmed about eight seconds of a close-up shot of the shell casings in Captain Fritz's hand. While these alleged portions of Ollier's film have never surfaced, preservation took a back seat while the film was being prepared for broadcast. Portions of the film were carelessly chopped up and discarded, and fragmentary clips are all that remains today. In any case, after supposedly filming the casings in the hand of Captain Fritz, Ollier recalled how they were deceitfully returned to the floor. Over 30 minutes later, Captain Fritz reached into his pocket and handed the casings to Detective Robert Studebaker. Studebaker never saw the original placement of the casings. 
so he tossed them on the floor and photographed them. To counterbalance these allegations of foul play, I must also mention that there were those who found nothing amiss about the cartridge cases. Did you see a picture taken of the holes? Yes, sir. When the picture was taken, were the holes in the same position as when you had first seen them? Yes, sir, they were. Even Mooney sort of agreed that the casings had not been moved, immediately after explaining that they had been moved. In the testimony we heard a few minutes ago, Mooney was shown this photograph. He then examined this one, taken from a different angle, before being shown this one. Now, these two are just differently cropped copies of the same photograph. I have another picture. Here is a picture taken, also from another angle. Does that show the cartridges? Yes, sir. Now, compare that with the other photograph. Yes, sir. Is that about the way it looked? Yes, sir. That is right. It sure is. That doesn't really gel with the casing supposedly being picked up and haphazardly tossed back on the floor, as Thomas Ollier would claim decades later. While there are question marks surrounding the chicken bones and the cartridge cases, there can be no doubt that some of the boxes in the sniper's nest were moved prior to being photographed. Do you have any pictures of the boxes near the window before they were moved, other than those you have showed me? Just these two. Then you don't have any pictures taken of the boxes before they were moved? No. Now, I will show you another picture. Was that taken by you? Yes. Does that show the position of the boxes before or after they were moved? That's after they were dusted. There's fingerprint dust on every box. And they were not in that position then when you first saw them? No. Several minutes after the sniper's nest was discovered, a bolt-action rifle was found between two rows of boxes near the stairway. Now, there was some initial confusion regarding its make and model. Some thought it looked like a mouser, but upon closer inspection, it was identified as an Italian Carcano. The officer who misidentified the rifle later explained that he did so at a glance. However, over a decade after the assassination, in 1976, a former deputy sheriff by the name of Roger Craig claimed to have seen the marking 7.65 Mauser stamped right on the barrel of the rifle. To some, this is evidence that a Mauser was in fact discovered on the sixth floor before being swapped for a Carcano. But Craig was the only person to make this specific claim, did so many years after the assassination, and after telling a journalist the following. Did you handle that rifle on the sixth floor? Yes, I did. I couldn't give its name because I don't know foreign rifles. I know it was foreign made and you loaded it downward into a built-in clip, but there was another rifle, a Mauser, found up on the roof of the depository that afternoon. There were no reports of a Mauser being found on the roof either. Besides, the only rifle seen in the film taken by Thomas Ollier is unmistakably a Carcano. Unique markings on the cartridge cases would later prove that this was indeed the rifle from which all three had been fired. Before the day was over, the rifle had been traced to a company in Chicago, Illinois. The company had sold the rifle to someone named A. Hiddell and shipped it to a post office box in Dallas in early 1963. Alec James Hiddell was a pseudonym known to have been used by Oswald. So there was now a direct link between the shells, the rifle and Oswald. Not only that, but Oswald's prints were lifted from both the rifle and boxes in the sniper's nest. Apart from the spent shells and the rifle, authorities discovered one other key piece of evidence. Did you find anything else up in the southeast corner of the sixth floor? Yes, sir. We found this brown paper sack, or case. It was made out of heavy wrapping paper. Actually, it looked similar to the paper that those books in the building was wrapped in. It was just a long, narrow paper bag. The bag was alleged to have been found here, yet this space is suspiciously empty in all the crime scene photographs. How long was the paper bag, approximately? I don't know. I picked it up and dusted it for prints, and they took it down there and sent it to Washington. And that's the last I'd seen of it, and I don't know. Did you take a picture of it before you picked it up? No. Does that sack show in any of the pictures you took? No, it doesn't show in any of the pictures. Detective Robert Studebaker, who had been working as a forensic assistant for less than two months, neglected to explain why he never photographed the bag. In Studebaker's defense, no one was on the lookout for a brown paper bag. 
Assassin, sure, rifle casings absolutely, but some debris in a dark-lit corner of the room. It wasn't until the bag was picked up and inspected that its significance became apparent. Do you remember anything about what the sack looked like? Well, it was assumed at the time that it was the sack that the rifle was wrapped up in when it was brought into the building, and it appeared that it could have been used for that. Now, as you may recall, Wesley Fraser drove Oswald back to Irving on November the 21st to pick up some curtain rods. The following morning, Oswald was seen carrying a package by both Fraser and his sister, Lenny Randall. According to Fraser, Oswald told him the package contained curtain rods, which he then brought back to Dallas. But you may also recall that Jack Doherty denied seeing such a package. Did you see Oswald come to work that morning? Yes, when he first came into the door. Did he have anything in his hands or arms? Well, not that I could see of. The thing is, Doherty was not a reliable witness. When questioned by the FBI and Secret Service, he appeared very confused about times and places. He required assistance from his father due to considerable difficulty in coordinating his mental faculties with his speech. While Doherty denied having such issues, his testimony is nonetheless riddled with contradictions. Wait a minute, did you go to lunch? Well, I went back downstairs to eat lunch, yes sir. What time? Oh, it was 12 o'clock. Wait a minute, did you hear the shots before or after your lunch? Before, before I ate my lunch. You heard shots before you ate your lunch? Let's see, yes, I believe I did. Now, did you hear a shot either before or after lunch? It was before lunch, it, it was before lunch. You think it was before lunch you heard the shot? I believe it was. Yes, sir. While Doherty insisted that Oswald had nothing in his hands when he arrived at work, it turned out that this certitude was based on nothing but a glance. Now, is that a very definite impression that you saw Oswald that morning when he came to work? Well, oh, it's like this. I'll try to explain it to you this way. You see, I was sitting on the wrapping table, and when he came in the door, I just caught him out of the corner of my eye. Given that Fraser had eyes on Oswald for several minutes, the weight of evidence suggests he carried a package to work on the morning of November the 22nd. A far more contentious question is whether the package carried by Oswald was the same as the brown paper bag discovered on the sixth floor. According to both Randall and Fraser, the only two witnesses known to have seen the package, the answer was a definite no. Now, was the length of the package any similar to the bag, anywhere near similar? Well, it wasn't that long. I mean, it was folded down at the top, as I told you. It definitely wasn't that long. I told the FBI that as far as the length of the bag, I told them that was entirely too long. Their main source of contention was that the package carried by Oswald was shorter than the brown paper bag. The bag was just long enough to store the rifle in its disassembled state, so if the package carried by Oswald was much shorter, then it could not have contained the rifle. Except, Randall saw it briefly, at a distance, through a window, while Fraser never paid it much attention. Did it look to you as if there was something heavy in the package? Well, I'll be frank with you, I didn't pay much attention to the package. In fact, the length of the package seemed about as certain to Fraser as his lack of attention to it. I didn't pay much attention. I didn't pay too much attention. I didn't pay any attention to it. I didn't pay much attention to the package. I didn't look at the package very much. Like I say, I didn't pay that much attention to it. I didn't pay too much attention to how he carried the package at all. The tape and paper with which the brown paper bag had been constructed matched the tape and paper used to wrap books for shipping on the first floor of the Book to Paul story. Not only that, but a fingerprint and palm print matching that of Oswald were also found on the bag. In spite of all this, some authors refuse to accept that the brown paper bag and the package carried by Oswald were one and the same. Instead, the argument tends to be that the bag was fabricated by authorities in an effort to frame Oswald. But you then have to square that against no curtain rods being found inside the Book to Paul story, Oswald already having curtains in his rented room in Dallas, him failing to obtain permission from his landlady to redecorate, him supposedly being in such urgent need of curtain rods that he just had to return to Irving on Thursday instead of waiting just one more day, him neglecting to mention anything about curtain rods to his wife and Ruth Payne upon his arrival, and that's despite the fact that Payne actually had some spare curtain rods in her garage. The same garage where Oswald stored his rifle. 
How did you learn of the shooting of President Kennedy? I was watching television and Ruth said someone had shot at the president. What did you say? It was uh, hard for me to say anything. We both turned pale. I went to my room and cried. Did you think immediately that your husband might have been involved? No. Did Mrs. Payne say anything about the possibility of your husband being involved? No, but she only said that, by the way, they fired from the building in which Lee is working. My heart dropped. I then went to the garage to see whether the rifle was there, and I saw that the blanket was still there, and I said, thank God. Did you look in the blanket to see if the rifle was there? I didn't unroll the blanket. It was in its usual position, and it appeared to have something inside. When did you learn that the rifle was not in the blanket? When the police arrived and asked whether my husband had the rifle, and I said yes. Then what happened? They began to search the apartment. When they came to the garage and took the blanket, I thought, well, now they will find it. They opened the blanket, but there was no rifle there. Around the time of the rifle's discovery on the sixth floor of the book depository, Captain William Fritz was appraised of Oswald's absence. Fritz immediately left the building and returned to police headquarters. We were standing in the hallway when Captain Fritz walked in. He walked up to my colleagues and made the statement to them, go get a search warrant and pick up a man named Lee Oswald. And I asked the captain why he wanted him, and he said, well, he was employed down at the book depository, and he had not been present for a roll call of employees. And we said, Captain, we will save you a trip, because there he sits. After escaping the book to Paul's story, Oswald boarded a bus right about here. But the assassination ground traffic to a halt, so Oswald soon left the bus and hailed a cab. After returning to his rooming house in Oak Cliff, a neighborhood in southwestern Dallas, Oswald changed his clothes, grabbed a gun, and left in a hurry. 78. You are in Oak Cliff area, are you not? The line's You will be at large for an emergency Police patrolman J.D. Tippett encountered Oswald some 45 minutes after the shooting, a bit further south, right about here. As soon as Tippett stepped out of the vehicle, Oswald drew his gun and fired four shots in rapid succession. Hello, police operator. Go ahead, it says news news. Hello, we've heard a shooting out here. Where is it at? Between Mark Davis and Buckley. It's a police officer. Somebody shot him. What, what's this? 44 Street. 78. It's been a police car. I notify one that uh, the officer involved in the shooting, which is Officer J.D. Tippett, we believe, was pronounced DOA at Methodist 128. Well, the only indication that it has any connection with this other shooting. Well, the descriptions on the suspects are similar. Uh, it is possible. Oswald was then caught sneaking into a nearby movie theater without purchasing a ticket. A large contingent of officers descended upon the theater. They surrounded the building, switched on the lights, and approached the suspect. Flanked by officers, Oswald drew a gun and a brief scuffle ensued. But this time he was quickly subdued, handcuffed, and taken to police headquarters back in downtown Dallas. Over the next two days, between his arrest and untimely death, Lee Harvey Oswald was interrogated by members of the Dallas Police, FBI, Secret Service, among others. None of it was recorded. Did you have any tape recorders? No, sir. I don't have a tape recorder. We need one. If we had one at this time, we could have handled these conversations far better. The Dallas Police Department doesn't have one. No, sir. I have requested one several times, but so far, they haven't got me one. So, no one knows exactly what was said inside this room. Instead, we have to settle for the cliff notes. And of a special interest to us is Oswald's alibi. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. You just heard uh, Oswald who said he did not shoot anybody. 
Oswald vehemently denied any involvement in the assassination. Instead, he claimed to have eaten lunch with two co-workers on the first floor of the Book Depot story. One of them was a black co-worker whose name Oswald could not recall. The other was James Jarman. Were you with anybody when you were walking around on the first floor finishing your sandwich? No, I wasn't. I was trying to get through so I could get out on the street. Did you see Lee Oswald? No, I didn't. After his arrest, he stated to a police officer that he had had lunch with you. Did you have a lunch with him? No, sir, I didn't. But according to another interrogator, Oswald's claim was not to have eaten lunch with Jarman and this unnamed co-worker, but merely that he saw them pass through the lunchroom while he was eating. Oswald stated that he had eaten lunch in the lunchroom at the Texas School Book Depository alone, but recalled possibly two black employees walking through the room during this period. He stated, possibly, one of these employees was called Junior, and the other was a short individual whose name he could not recall, but whom he would be able to recognize. So, according to this version of events, Oswald's alibi was that he possibly saw two co-workers, one whose name he could not recall, enter and traverse the lunchroom, together or separately, during an unspecified period of time. Whether Oswald claimed to have eaten lunch with or in proximity of his colleagues, it makes no difference because neither alibi could be substantiated. Instead, James Jarman had last seen Oswald taking an elevator upstairs sometime between half past 11 and 12 o'clock. William Shelley and Eddie Piper had last seen Oswald roaming about the first floor around noon, at which time Oswald had told Piper that he was either going out or going up to eat lunch. Then there's the account of Charles Givens. You may recall that Givens is officially recognized as the last person inside the book depository known to have seen Oswald before the assassination. Their encounter was fixed at 11.55 and is supposed to have taken place on the sixth floor. But prior to relating this version of events, Givens had reportedly told the FBI that he saw Oswald on the first floor at 11.50, a statement which he later denied ever making. Either way, Oswald being on the first floor at noon does absolutely nothing to prevent him from being on the sixth, half an hour later. Unless Carolyn Arnold is to be believed. As Mrs. Arnold was standing in front of the building, she stated she thought she caught a fleeting glimpse of Lee Harvey Oswald standing in the hallway between the front door and the double doors leading to the warehouse located on the first floor. She could not be sure that this was Oswald, but she said she felt it was and believed the time to be a few minutes before 12.15 p.m. So that would be about here. In a subsequent statement, Arnold claimed to have gone outside as late as 12.25, thereby pushing the time of her potential ground floor sighting of Oswald as close as five minutes before the shooting. Putting aside the fact that her observation was described as a fleeting glimpse and that she could not be certain of the man's identity, Arnold herself will later deny it ever happened. That is completely foreign to me. It would have forced me to have been turning back around to the building when, in fact, I was trying to watch the parade. Why would I be looking back inside the building? That doesn't make any sense to me. Instead, Arnold claimed that this encounter had actually taken place in the second floor lunchroom. I do not recall that Oswald was doing anything. I just recall that he was sitting there in one of the booth seats on the right-hand side of the room as you go in. He was alone, as usual, and appeared to be having lunch. I did not speak to him, but I recognized him clearly. The problem with both of these accounts is that none of her colleagues reported anything remotely similar. Whether it was the first or second floor, Oswald was apparently invisible to everyone but Arnold. Besides, it took Arnold 15 years to relate her revised version of events. Not ideal for such a time-sensitive issue. That being said, depending on what conspiracy theory you're willing to entertain, there are ways to interpret what Oswald told his interrogators so that it aligns with either one of Arnold's accounts. Take this one, for instance. Oswald stated he was present for work at the book depository on the morning of November the 22nd and, at noon, went to lunch. He went to the second floor to get a Coca-Cola and returned to the first floor to eat lunch. Then he went outside to watch the presidential parade. This claim is interesting because in the early days of the assassination, it appeared to be supported by photographic evidence. But this figure was quickly identified as Billy Lovelady, a man who bore such a close resemblance to Oswald that when footage of Oswald first appeared on television, Lovelady's stepchildren thought it was him. Now, speaking only for myself here, Really? Am I missing something here? Because they're not exactly doppelgangers, right? 
Anyway, in recent years another such figure, this time with even fewer pixels to work with, has once again been the subject of debate. Because this much of a person can't be positively identified, some believe it, therefore, it must be Oswald. On the other hand, Oswald explicitly denied watching the motorcade when he spoke with another interrogator, not to mention that his presence outside went completely unnoticed by all those who did watch the motorcade. Now, there's one final account of Oswald's supposed alibi that stands out from the rest. It stands out because it really skirts the line of self-incrimination. When asked as to his whereabouts at the time of the shooting, Oswald stated that when lunchtime came and he didn't say which floor he was on, he said one of the black employees invited him to eat lunch with him and he stated, you go on down and send the elevator back up and I will join you in a few minutes. Before he could finish whatever he was doing, he stated the commotion surrounding the assassination took place. And when he went downstairs, a policeman questioned him as to his identification, and his boss stated that he is one of our employees, whereupon the policeman had him step aside momentarily. Following this, he simply walked out the front door of the building. If this is an accurate recollection of what Oswald said, he placed himself on a floor above the second at the time of the shooting. While he neglected to mention which floor, he described a conversation between himself and an unnamed black co-worker which sounds remarkably similar to the one described by Charles Givens. This would mean that Oswald, seemingly by accident, placed himself on the sixth floor during the shooting. After that horribly confusing mishmash of stories, what have we learned? Well, Oswald appears to have contradicted himself by offering multiple alibis. It's also possible that what he said was misunderstood or otherwise misrepresented by the interrogation participants. As mentioned at the beginning of all this, we don't actually know what Oswald said. This is all based on second-hand accounts related days, weeks, or even months after the assassination. But the main takeaway has to be the lack of corroboration. With the exception of Carolyn Arnold, a highly unreliable witness, no one laid eyes on Oswald between roughly noon and the shooting. At least, no one inside the Book to Paul story. Among those who witnessed the sniper in the sniper's nest, Howard Brennan was the only one who thought he could identify the gunman. At least, that's what he stated initially. Within a few hours of the shooting, Brennan had become far less certain. Upon arrival at the police station, Mr. Brennan said, I don't know if I can do you any good or not, because I've seen the man that they have under arrest on television. And he said, I just don't know whether I can identify him positively or not, because he said that the man on television was a bit disheveled and his shirt was open or something like that. And he said, the man I saw in the book depository was not in that condition. Brennan was then brought down to the basement of the police station to view a lineup of suspects. Among them was Oswald. Mr. Brennan looked very carefully and he said, I cannot positively say. I said, well, is there anyone there that looks like the man in the book depository? He said, well, that second man from the left, who was Oswald, he looks like him. Then he repeated that the man he saw in the book depository was not disheveled. So, that's not ideal. While Brennan did pick Oswald from a lineup, that identification was far from certain. But if Brennan is to be believed, this uncertainty was not genuine, but merely an act intended to protect his family. I believed at that time, and I still believe, the assassination was a communist activity. And I felt like there hadn't been more than one eyewitness. And if it got to be a known fact that I was an eyewitness, my family or I, either one, might not be safe. Well, if you wouldn't have identified Oswald during the lineup, might he not have been released by the police? No, I already knew they had the man for murder, and I knew he would not be released. The murder of whom? Of Officer J.D. Tippett. Well, what happened in between to change your mind that you later decided to come forth and tell the FBI that you could identify him? After Oswald was killed, I was relieved quite a bit that, uh, as far as pressure on myself of somebody not wanting me to identify anybody, there was no longer that immediate danger. 
Mr. Brennan, could you tell us now whether you can or cannot positively identify the man you saw in the sixth floor window as the same man that you saw in the police station? I could at that time. I could, with all sincerity, identify him as being the same man. So, according to Brennan, within a few hours of the assassination, he'd become concerned that it was the product of a communist conspiracy. He feared that should he attempt to identify the gunman, he could become a target and thereby endanger his family. Did you and your wife discuss any aspect of the assassination and you being present more or less at the scene of the assassination? Yes, we discussed it. We talked. I talked of moving her and my grandson, who was living with us at that time, and my daughter, moving them out of town somewhere in secrecy. My wife seemed to think that a person can't get away wherever they go. So when Brennan was brought down to view a lineup later that evening, he feigned uncertainty to protect his family. At least, so he claimed. I leave it up to you to decide whether to believe or disbelieve Brennan's story. On Sunday morning, November 24th, Oswald was scheduled for transfer from the city to the county jail. Reporting from outside the police station, a local news correspondent couldn't help but to jinx the whole shebang. Now this is the armored truck that will carry Lee Harold Oswald from the basement here of Dallas Police Headquarters downtown to the Dallas County Sheriff's Office and the Dallas County Jail. Strict security precautions have been exercised from the very beginning and have been even increased this morning as fear arises and grows stronger that someone may attempt to take the life of the man accused of murdering the President of the United States. He's been shot. He's been shot. The Oswald has been shot. The doctors at Parkland Hospital said that the single shot could scarcely have done more damage to a body than that shot did to Lee Harvey Oswald. It penetrated his spleen, his pancreas, the aorta, the kidney, and the liver. Oswald expired at 1.07 p.m. He died? He died at 1.07 p.m. We have arrested the man. The man will, will be charged with murder. Who is he? The, man, the suspect's name is Jack Rubenstein, I believe. He goes by the name of Jack Ruby. That's all I have to say. Throughout this video, we've encountered witnesses who not only contradicted each other, but also themselves. Central to many arguments of conspiracies that these contradictions represent attempts by the conspirators to conceal the truth. And to give you an example, Charles Givens initially claimed to have seen Oswald on the first floor at 11.50. Then he denied ever saying that and claimed to have spoken with Oswald on the sixth floor at 11.55. Some authors have found this change a bit too convenient and suspected Givens was coerced to change his story by the conspirators. In support of that conclusion, we have this document in which Dallas Police Lieutenant Jack Revel said the following. Lieutenant Revel stated that Givens had been previously handled by the Dallas Police Department on a marijuana charge, and he believes that Givens would change his story for money. About two months later, Givens did precisely that. He changed his story. But let's have a think about this. According to this interpretation of events, the conspirators had free reign to dictate Givens' testimony. They could have told him what to say or perhaps rewritten his testimony after the fact. You may recall that that is precisely what Victoria Adams claimed and Carolyn Arnold implied earlier in the video, that someone had put words in their mouth by altering the written record. Okay, so wielding that near limitless power, what words did the conspirators choose to put in the mouth of Givens? Well, they supposedly invented a brief conversation about lunch in elevators, away from the sniper's nest, more than half an hour before the shooting. I guess I saw Oswald sitting in the sniper's nest, or even I saw Oswald carrying a large package heading for the sniper's nest, was a bit 
you on the nose? The same is of course true of every other witness in Dealey Plaza. Apart from the doubtful identification by Howard Brennan, no one could actually place Oswald in the sniper's nest at the time of the shooting. I really cannot stress this enough. It apparently did not occur to the conspirators to have at least one witness unambiguously identify Oswald as the assassin. Better yet, take a photograph. For all this talk of witness coercion and evidence tampering, that, that seems like a bit of an oversight. What I'm trying to illustrate is that it's surprisingly trivial to pluck a stray document here, an unfounded allegation there, and sprinkle in some thoughts about means and motive, and you'll end up with a conspiracy theory that, at least on the surface, sounds convincing. Whether it's organized crime, a foreign government, or domestic agency, there's enough material here to make a compelling case against countless groups and individuals, something upon which many authors, filmmakers, and others have capitalized to great success. I don't know if all of them are right or wrong, this video clearly doesn't cover enough ground for me to determine that, but to ascribe a conspiratorial motive to anything remotely suspicious seems irresponsibly black and white for a case so clouded by shades of grey. A person acting in a way that's unlawful, unethical, untruthful does not prove they colluded in a plot to assassinate the President of the United States. Such thrilling leaps of conspiracy make for entertaining stories, but that doesn't make them true. Remember Thomas Allier. He was the journalist filming on the sixth floor during the initial search for the assassin. Decades later, Allier began accusing officers of tampering with the evidence, staging photographs, and lying on their oath. The veracity of those allegations aside, the fascinating thing about Allier is that he never believed Kennedy fell victim to a conspiracy. Allier had a refreshingly nuanced take on the assassination by recognizing that evidence of corruption is not the same as evidence of conspiracy. Sloppy police work neither began nor ended with the Kennedy assassination and people lie for all sorts of reasons. Loyalty, embarrassment, fear, pride, attention, power, money, th there's no shortage of motivations to choose from. Besides, what kind of clueless masterminds would allow a cameraman to casually film their supposed cover-up? Something I found myself doing a lot while making this video was attempting to view the assassination from the perspective of the alleged conspirators. You could, for instance, question the logic of placing an assassin in this specific window, a window in which he ran the risk of being caught red-handed by other workers inside the building, a window in which he could have easily been and actually was spotted by spectators in the approaching motorcade, a window from which his view was partially obstructed by a tree. You can also question the logic of using a sniper to shoot at a moving target in the first place, especially when that person had a tendency to stand still in very exposed public places. If Oswald acted alone and the assassination was a crime of opportunity, these less than ideal choices start to make a lot more sense. He found himself at the right place at the right time, had mere days to prepare, and used the only building to which he had access. But for a group of conspirators to handicap their own assassination plot requires a bit more ingenuity to explain. He was a patsy, he was supposed to get caught, there were multiple assassins, you, you know the drill. But there's so much of that in this case. So much had to go just right for a conspiracy and the subsequent cover-up to succeed. From the roundabout process by which Oswald was hired at the Book de Paul story to the selection of the motorcade route, from Oswald's narrow escape and subsequent arrest to him being given multiple chances to speak with the press, from the supposed tampering, suppression, and planting of evidence to dozens of expert witnesses being successfully fooled or coaxed to lie under oath. Not only would a plan as complex and prolonged as this one have been difficult to predict with countless points of failure, but it seems and excuse my language here, a bit overkill. Yes, Kennedy was the President of the United States, but he was not exactly difficult to access. He was rather famous for abandoning his Secret Service detail and wandering off into crowds. In fact, that's precisely what he did on multiple occasions during this very trip. Now, decided to shake hands with one or two more people, but this is the moment where the Secret Service has its point of tension. They say, when the president stops moving, that's when we're concerned, because that is when the possibility of trouble comes to the forefront. This 
was one of those impromptu moments for which President Kennedy is so well known. So many times you have heard that the Secret Service men suddenly find themselves without the president, that suddenly he has left them and stepped into the crowd and decided to shake hands and give his personal greetings. You could say perhaps that this is more the norm now than the unexpected because it has been done so many times. As this news correspondent was alluding to just a few minutes before the actual shooting, all it takes is one person with a gun at point-blank range. Not unlike the shooting of Oswald. Think about that the next time you watch a documentary or read one of the thousands of books implicating members of the Secret Service, FBI, CIA, Dallas Police Department, politicians, lawyers, doctors, investigators, witnesses, and so forth. Think about how all these alleged co-conspirators did not have to be a part of any of this. Just one person in a crowd whose guilt is assured the moment they pull the trigger. By roping in this ensemble cast of characters, it inadvertently makes the conspirators seem clueless. I like to imagine a conference room, and up against the wall stands a board upon which they've mapped out the whole thing. All the people they need to manipulate, all the evidence they have to fabricate. The entire patchwork of needless risk-taking laid out bare before them. And they looked at that, and then looked at each other and went, Yep, that's a solid plan. But even then, even if we assume the conspirators didn't really think it through or, I don't know, made it up as they went along, that doesn't really jive with them not getting caught. Something that would have taken a lot of planning, skill and ingenuity. So, I guess you somehow have to convince yourself that they were clueless enough to wing the crime of the century, yet clever enough to get away with it. And therefore, there was no conspiracy. No, I, I don't believe any of these arguments make it impossible for others to have been involved, they just make it a bit more difficult to keep that tinfoil hat firmly in place. I mean, if there was an argument with which to close the book on this case, I would not be the first to think of it nearly six decades and a continent removed from the events in question. I can guarantee you that much. Also, the word conspiracy doesn't even necessarily mean that there were other people involved in the planning and execution of the assassination. For instance, there's what some refer to as a benign conspiracy. This typically means that there was a cover-up, but it was not motivated by the concealment of complicity, as is so often assumed. Instead, Oswald did act alone, but there was some other motive behind the suppression of evidence. A common one being that federal agencies attempted to save face by concealing or downplaying the full extent of their failure to prevent the assassination. I mean, a known communist with ties to Russia, blindsiding the entire intelligence community by assassinating the commander-in-chief on a public street in broad daylight at the height of the Cold War, is not exactly resume material. Point being that there are countless ways to interpret the evidence in a case as vast as this one. I am not exaggerating when I say that you could easily make dozens of these videos and still have plenty left to talk about. After all, the Texas School Book DePaul story is but one piece of a much larger puzzle. Thanks for watching. Support me on Patreon if you want to. Okay, bye.